Jesus fully realised all that was going to happen to him, so he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for? he asked. Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing there. As Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Once more, he asked them, Who are you looking for? And again they replied, Jesus the Nazarene. I told you that I am he, Jesus said. And since I am the one you want, let the others go. This was the fulfilled the word that, had, that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost no one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officer of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, so did another disciple. And since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside the door, so the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door, and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I'm not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter, Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about the disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the, the, the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there, warming himself. So they asked him, Are you, are you one of his disciples too? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Did I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment was a, roost a rooster began to crow. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the, to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace, because they wanted to be able to eat at the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate just said, He said, What is again? And called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own account, or the others say it to, to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, and I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. 
The man said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate mm -hmm. said to him, What is truth? <laughs> After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, and told them I find no fault, I find no guilt in him. For well, you have a custom that I should release one man to you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, no, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. When Pilate and Jesus brought the judge the soldiers wore the crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put a cup of robe on him. Hail him the Jews, they mocked, and they slapped him across the face. Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I am going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the cup of robe, and Pilate said, Look, here is the man. When they saw him, the leading priests and temple guards began shouting, Crucify him, crucify him. Take him yourselves and cru crucify him, Pilate said. I find him not guilty. The Jewish leaders replied, By our Lord, he ought to die because he called himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more frightened than ever. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and an Aramaic, Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. We read that whole long passage because it's, it, it, it takes us through the trial of Jesus from the moment he was arrested. We've just looked at his final teaching to his disciples. Today is actually Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter. But we're going to look at these, this, the moment of Jesus' arrest from chapter 18 all the way through to, 20, to chapter 19 and verse 16 where Jesus is then sentenced to be crucified. John doesn't tell us there's actually more events that happen during Jesus' trial, he, it says that, he goes, they, that, that Annas sends him to Caiaphas, but John doesn't tell us that part because John has specific things that he wants us to understand, and so he picks out the key events that, that correspond to the things that he wants us to understand about Jesus. And the key issue through this whole passage is this idea of truth. Truth. You notice that Peter denies the truth. The Pharisees hide the truth. And Pilate says, ah, what is truth? Truth is the key issue. The truth about who Jesus is. That's the key issue through this passage. And he is the king. He is the king. He's the king of truth. He comes to, as he says it in chapter, in chapter 18 and verse 20, verse 37, he says, For this purpose I was born to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of truth listens to my voice. You see, Jesus is divisive in this passage because he doesn't just do your truth and my truth. He does the truth. He reveals the truth of our hearts. 
He reveals the inner motivations of our hearts, the idols that we want to serve. He reveals those things. And so, right from the beginning of chapter 18, I'm struck by how Jesus is all about truth. He's open. He's open-handed. He doesn't hide. He walks forward knowing what the Father has for him. Look in verses, chapter 18 in verses 1 and 2. It says, Jesus, when He had spoken these words, that's the teaching from verses 13 through 17. When He had spoken these words, He went out where there was a garden. And in verse 2 it says, Judas, who betrayed Him, knew the place, for Jesus often met there with His disciples. If you remember back in chapter 13, Jesus knows that Judas is going to betray Him. And now, He leads His disciples to a place where He knows Judas will find Him. He's not hiding. In verse 4, it says, Jesus, again, knowing all that would happen. He's not hiding. He's walking into it with eyes wide open. He's about truth. He is truth. And when the soldiers, the band of soldiers and officers and the chief priests and the Pharisees with their lanterns and their torches and their weapons come to seek Him, He doesn't hide in the dark corners of the garden. He comes forward. And He says, who are you looking for? Whom do you seek? And in verse 5, it's kind of marvelous. We lose it a little bit in the English. They say, Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. And He says, I am He. He's using the, 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 Greek, the, the Greek words He uses. He speaks there, or the Aramaic words. It's, the, it's, 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 it's Yahweh. It's I am from the Old Testament. And everybody falls over. <laughs> he could get out of this situation if He wanted to. But he knows what's going to happen. He knows what the Father has planned. And he's going to walk into his own death for his and the Father's glory and for our good. Again in verse 8, he answers them. It's me. I am. I've already told you. But let these men go. He, seeks to, he wants to protect His disciples. He prayed about that. If you remember last week, chapter 17, Jesus asks the Father, He says, keep those that You have given Me. Keep them in Your name because while I was here on earth, I protected them. I guarded them. But now I'm coming to You. So I want You to protect them. To keep them. And here he's, he's in this final moment, He's continuing to protect and guard. Not just spiritually, but physically as well. He doesn't want them to be arrested. And then... He stops. Simon Peter draws his sword. Simon Peter, if you remember, we'll come to Peter later at the end. But Peter says to Jesus, I want to die for you. I want to, uh, where are you going? I'll come with you. I'll lay my life down for you. I love Peter. So he pulls out his sword and he chops the guy's ear off. And Jesus says, stop. stop. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has for me? Do you, do you see the picture of Jesus that John is presenting? He is utterly and entirely in control. There's nothing false about Him. He's truth. He's the King of truth. Turn with me just for a second to Acts in chapter 2 and verse 23. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. Here's what Peter, on the day of Pentecost, here's what he says about these moments. He's speaking to the men of Israel in Acts chapter 2 at verse 22. He says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through Him in your midst. As you yourselves know, He says, This Jesus, in verse 23, This Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. God planned it. It was according to His foreknowledge. And you, He says, crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Somehow, God planned it. God the Father is entirely in control. Jesus is entirely in control. And yet, lawless men crucified and killed Jesus. But it was according to God's plan. Turn with me to 1 Peter in chapter 2 to read again what Peter says about it. 1 Peter in chapter 2. Verse 20, 23. He's talking about Jesus in these moments through His trial, His beating, 
his, his walk up the hill, his crucifixion. And he says, Jesus, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So here's Jesus in John chapter 18, walking forward in truth, entrusting himself to him who judges justly, knowing that this, all of this is according to God's, the Father's plan. He's in control. And so the rest of the chapter, and into chapter 19, John deals with Jesus' interactions with three different groups of people. First, there's Peter, and I said we're going to come to Peter at the end because that's... I want to close with that. But in the meantime, it says that the, the soldiers and the officers of the, 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 pre, of, the, of, the high, of the chief priests, they arrested Jesus and they took him to Annas and Caiaphas. And so Jesus' first encounter is with what I want to call organized religion. <laughs> organized religion. Organized religion, false religion, counterfeit religion, any kind of religion, it might call itself Christian, it might call itself something else, but organized religion is anything that adds or subtracts to Jesus. Yeah. We talked about Islam this morning. Islam says, yes, we believe in Jesus. What do you believe about Jesus? He was a prophet. Uh, they've subtracted from Jesus. Jesus is far more than just a prophet. In Hinduism, Jesus is one of many ways to get to God. Uh, you've subtracted from Jesus. Jesus says he's the only way to get to God. There are certain churches, organized religion, you walk in and they say, yeah, you need all of Jesus. And you need to speak in tongues and you need to do five other things or you need to do confession and you need to have communion. There's Jesus plus. <laughs> Organized. Jesus is against organized religion. Jesus encounters organized religion and he reveals ultimately what it is ultimately worshiping. We're going to see that. And so Jesus is taken to Annas. It says Annas is the high priest. Annas is actually not high priest. He was high priest. He's the father-in-law of Caiaphas. Two of his other sons have been high priest as well. And Caiaphas is now the high, the high priest. Uh, there's, there's rhymes written about Annas and his corruption. When Jesus cleared out the temple, guess whose business suffered? Annas' business. These are corrupt and evil men. They're not interested in the truth about Jesus. In verse, chapter 18 and verse 19, they take Jesus and they conduct what is actually, according to Jewish law, an illegal interrogation. Annas wants to know about Jesus' teaching and his disciples. And Jesus is the king of truth, remember, friends. And so he doesn't answer their question. Rather, he's pushing them towards truth. He's saying, well, you know what I've taught. Let's, let's, let's conduct a proper trial here. You know I've not hid anything. I've not taught anything in secret. Let's call some witnesses. That's what our law calls for. Let's call some witnesses. Let's have a proper trial. Jesus says, I've got nothing to hide. He's the king of truth. But they don't want to do that. And so in the end, they take him to, in verse 28, they take him to the governor's headquarters where Pilate lives. And you notice in verse 28, they don't want to enter Pilate's headquarters. Because for a Jew to enter a Gentile's home <laughs> would make them unclean. And then they couldn't celebrate the Passover properly. So while they're trying, in the process of trying to put an innocent man to death, they're also trying to maintain this pretense of religious cleanness so that they can celebrate the, celebrate the Passover. Do you see the irony? And Pilate says to them in verse 29, what accusation do you bring against this man? And Jesus said, uh, sorry, the, the, the Pharisees say, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. In other words, believe us, he's done something bad. You don't need to know what it is. And Pilate says, well, judge him according to your own law. And the Pharisees show their hand. Well, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. 
believe us, he did something wrong. Kill him for us. <laughs> this is where organized religion ends up when it denies Jesus. It, it ends up asking political power to wield the sword on its behalf. It, it's happened over and over again in history, friends. But Jesus is the king of truth. He reveals, and we'll get to where, where everybody ends up in chapter 19. But for now, we're going to leave the organized religion, and we're going to turn to Pilate. Jesus' conversation with Pilate. Jesus has a fascinating conversation with Pilate. Pilate turned, hauls him in, and, and you notice immediately, all of a sudden, Pilate is using this phrase in verse 33, he keeps calling Jesus the king of the Jews. You, you see, Pilate's real concern is earthly political power. That's what he's concerned. Are you a king? Because then you're a threat if you're a king. If you're, if you're trying to lead some kind of rebellion and set up your own kingdom. and uh, That's Pilate's concern. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus, again, he's not answering his question. Do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to me? You see, in the same way that with, with the Jews, with the Pharisees, Jesus is going, I want to deal with your heart, ultimately. <laughs> he wants to know, Pilate, are you asking an honest question, or do you have an agenda? Are you asking, or did you get told to ask this? You see, Pilate is really only interested in truth as far as it, it serves his purposes. If it's not helping him, he's pragmatic about it. If it's not helping him, he's not interested in truth. But Jesus is interested in ultimate, absolute, what's ultimately true. And he says that in verse 36. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. And Pilate says to him, so you are a king. Jesus said, no, you say I'm a king, but my purpose was to bear witness to the truth. And at that point, Pilate goes, eh, what's truth? <laughs> your, your kingdom is not of this world. You're not really, yeah, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't care whatever else you have to say. You're not a threat to me. And so he moves on to other, now he's, he's not concerned with Jesus anymore. Pilate is now concerned with trying to smooth things over with the Jews. What do I have to do to release Jesus and make them happy and appease them? And so both, both organized religion, friends, and both political power, ultimately, both abandon truth. Both completely abandon truth. The Jews will do and say anything. They're completely focused on having Jesus crucified. And Pilate is not interested in... He's, Jesus is not really a king. He knows he's innocent. If you notice, three times, Pilate says in verse 38, he goes back outside to the Jews and said, I don't find any guilt in him. And then again in 19, chapter 19 and verse uh, four and then in verse six he says I don't find any guilt in him Pilate knows the truth he knows that Jesus is innocent but he's not concerned about what's true anymore he's concerned about preserving his own power and influence and so Pilate ends up in this place in verse 19 sorry in chapter 19 he says to Jesus you, you notice Pilate's descent into madness as it were the Jews say to him, Jesus, in verse 7, chapter 19 and verse 7, the Jews say to, to, to Pilate, you need to kill him, you need to crucify him because this man has made himself a son of God. And then Pilate, all of a sudden, in verse 8, he heard the statement, he was even more afraid. And then he goes back to Jesus, and now, too late, he's interested in the truth. Where did you come from, he says to Jesus. Where did you come from? And he says in verse 10, don't you know I have authority? This is political power. I have authority to crucify you or to release you. Some fireworks out there. Sunday morning. How about that? He says, I have authority. And Jesus says, no, you don't. You've abandoned truth. You don't have any authority. The only authority you have was given to you. And so Pilate ends up in this place where he is meant to be Caesar's representative, but now he's actually controlled by the Jews, in verses 12 and 13, 
Pilate's trying to release him. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you're not Caesar's friend. Now Pilate's get, I I, I don't want anybody to accuse me of not being Caesar's friend. This is is Roman Roman Empire. Caesar is God. (laughs) Caesar's all controlling. So Pilate's going, "Ah, okay, he's got to die. That's it. And so he ends up abandoning the truth, abandoning authority, being controlled by the religious leaders. And the religious leaders, you'll notice where they end up all the way down in verse 15. And you need, we need to understand how momentous this is. Pilate says, Behold your king. Do you want me to crucify him? And they say, We have no king but Caesar. The Jewish leaders, the Jewish, the, 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 the organized religion of Judaism who holds that they have no God but the true God, but Yahweh, He is their king. They're under His sovereign rule directly. They look at Pilate and say, we have no king but Caesar. It's blasphemy. It's blasphemy. Friends, this is why Jesus says, in chapter 17, when he prays for his disciples, he says, you are in the world, but you are not of it. And the world hates you. It doesn't understand you. Why? Because both organized religion and, and political power are against Jesus. Because he wants to reveal their ultimate motivations. He wants to reveal their ultimate goals. The idols that they worship. And they don't want that. And Jesus is the true king. And ultimately, we sang it earlier, one day every tongue tongue will confess, every knee will bow that Jesus is Lord. We'll bow before Him. If you want to know about the ultimate end of of organized religion and, 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 and political power, they come together in the city called, represented by the city of Babylon in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Their ultimate end is destruction. But friends, we serve Jesus. We, don't, we, don't, we shouldn't get cozy with political power. We don't get cozy with organized religion. We sit somewhere awkwardly off to one side because we're not like that. We don't need those things. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. And Jesus, friends, 1 Corinthians in chapter 1. Turn with me there. Here's what it says about Jesus before we come to Peter. 1 Corinthians in chapter 1. 1 Corinthians in chapter 1 and verse... 18. Paul says this. He says, The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. In verse 23, he says this. We preach Christ crucified, and Christ crucified, the message of Jesus, the gospel, is a stumbling block to the Jews. It's offensive to them. Think back to the, the, the Pharisees and their blind, blind ambition to have Jesus crucified. He's offensive to them. Just get rid of him. A stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. Pilate's going, your kingdom's not of this world. <laughs> Who cares? What is truth? Who cares? But to us who are being saved, it is the power and the wisdom of God. Let me turn back to Peter. And let's make it personal. Peter, I love Peter. In the midst of Jesus dealing with big things, and you might be going, Tim, wait, wait, what's, what does this mean for us? This is what we're getting to. In the midst of Jesus dealing with the world, organized religion and political power and revealing them for what they truly are, their idols, and we don't need to trust in their idols of power and influence and control. We don't need to trust those things. We trust Jesus. Jesus deals with Peter. We talked about chapter 13. Jesus is saying, I'm going to leave. And Peter says, where are you going? Don't you know I would lay my life down for me? And Jesus says to Peter, you're going to betray me three times before the cock crows. And then in chapter 18, remember Peter cuts off. He wants to do something for Jesus. He doesn't fully understand Jesus yet because he doesn't understand he has to die, but he loves Jesus and he wants to do something. And so he's like, Jesus, he's being crucified. No, what's up? You can't be arrested. We've got to stop this. 
He's zealous for Jesus, even though he doesn't fully understand. And he winds up in this terrible place where he denies knowing Jesus three times. And remember, Jesus is the king of truth. Jesus is the king of truth. Peter loves Jesus. Jesus wants to deal with Peter's heart. And so he, even as he's protecting him, even as he's taking care of him, Jesus allows Peter to go to this place, this deep, dark place, where he comes away in tears. John doesn't tell us that. tells us that in a different gospel. But Peter denied his, the one he loves, he denied him three times. And I suspect that in the midst of that, Jesus is breaking down Peter's heart. He's breaking down his idols because he wants to build them back up again. He does in John chapter 21. And so friends, what, what, I want, what I want you to take away from this this morning is first of all, we're in the world, but we're not of it. And what, it mean, what that means is that we don't need political power. We don't need organized religion. We just need Jesus. He's the one we need. And there are lots of different voices out there speaking bits and pieces of truth, and some of it's lies, and how do you tell the difference? And when you, st when you know Jesus, when you dive in deeper and know him more and more deeply, you start to be able to, pick, to, to, to piece together the big picture in him. He pieces it together for you. But we need to see the world through Jesus. How do you do that? Friends, keep reading this. Keep reading this. We, 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 on Thursday night with uh, TNT, 20s and 30s, apparently it's catching on. We, 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 and, and on Tuesday nights in Bible, in Bible study, we try and preach from the Scriptures on Sunday morning, but on Tuesday nights and Thursday nights, we sit down and we read a passage of Scripture and going, okay, Lord Jesus, what, do you, what are you saying to me through this passage? You go, Tim, you could, you know, people could say anything. No, no, we're coming to it honestly. What is He saying to me by the power of the Spirit through His Word? We do it in community to encourage each other. But as we do that over time, you know what the result is? We start to see the world through Jesus. We don't need to understand everything because he understands it all. But we have a sense of, what do I need to do in this situation in my life that I'm in right now? Oh, I'm feeling down. I need joy. I've got issues at work. I've got issues with family. We come together. We walk together. We encourage each other. We pray. That's why we pray together every Sunday morning because we're walking. We're encouraging each other in that walk. How do I walk beside Jesus, see the world through him, become like him? Maybe this morning you are wrestling with Jesus, trying to figure This is what Peter's doing. He made a mess of it in this case. But he's trying to work out. He wants to do something for Jesus. It's a good thing to want to do something for him. I love his passions. When we get older. I'm, I'm in the process of getting We're all in the process of getting older. But you get older and we lose some of that passion. Can I encourage you? Jesus has something for you. You could do something for him. You've got a coworker that, that you could pray for. You've got a coworker that needs to hear about Jesus. You've got a family member who, who, who's feeling lost and alone. You've got someone you could in, invite into your home and exercise hospitality. You could start a Bible study with two other people in your school. Jesus has something for you to do, and yeah, you might mess it up, but you know what? Jesus grows you through it, and he restores you. That's what he does with Peter in John chapter 21. He doesn't leave you out hanging out to dry. So friends, let's walk like Jesus. What does he have for you to do? He's the king of truth. He loves you. He wants to deal with your heart so that you love him truly, properly, purely. Let's pray.